Hello, thanks for, for your patience with us. So it's today not only how to do a, an artist in residence program in a pandemic, but also how to do an artist in residence program in a thunderstorm with technical problems. So uh, thank you for your patience. And um, yeah, and let's start with the introduction of uh, the artist in residence program, RCIES, uh, the Institute of Epigenetics and Stem Cells at the Helmholtz Center in Munich. And uh, yeah, uh, I will just start by introducing uh, the panelists. Unfortunately, we still have to wait for Maria Elena Torres Padilla, who is the director of the Institute of Epigenetics and Stem Cells, but she will join us in a few minutes. Uh, then uh, I want to introduce uh, Clara Ermov, um, uh, PhD researcher at the Institute of Epigenetics and Stem Cells. I will start to say IEF. Uh, Stefan Hampel, a group leader uh, working with Maria Elena. Then I will introduce uh, Anna Dimitriou, uh, our artist in residence, uh, who started the residency at the IES already last year in summer. And last but not least, Michael Sean Gorman. Uh, Director of uh, Biotopia, a uh, professor at LMU, <laughs> and also uh, yeah, a driving force in developing science galleries. So uh, we will have an interesting conversation. Um, yeah, so uh, maybe let's start a little bit uh, late, a little, wait a little bit longer for uh, Maria Elena to join. So we will just start straight away with Michael Ton. Uh, yes. <laughs> why? Okay. Uh, yeah, because we want to talk about art and science. We want to talk about why art and science is important and why residences are interesting. So I think it's, it's nice to start with you. Uh, and then Maria Elena can join in what inspired her. OK. So what do you, what do you want to ask me? I'm so all yours. What inspired you to start to work in this intersection and why you thought it's so interesting to bring bring these projects to a university and to research centers and to work with artists and also artists in residence? Sure. Um, well, thanks a lot, Claudia. And, and it's really great to be here as uh, uh, part of this panel and also to that uh, Anna Dimitriou, who is really one of the leading artists working at the intersection of art and science, is a uh, uh, doing this residency, uh, which is a very innovative step for the Helmholtz Center in München. Uh, and uh, it's, it's exciting, obviously a, a difficult moment to do a residency when, when one can't be physically resident in, in the center. And I'm sure we'll hear about that experience later. Um, but um, just you asked why I got interested in, in connecting art and science. And, and uh, uh, I suppose that's quite a long story, but just to cut it short a bit, I, I originally uh, worked in physics and philosophy and then became very interested in the history of science and, the, and uh, the 17th century when art and science weren't really so distant from each other and uh, working on people like Galilei, who was also a trained draftsman who trained in the Academy of Design in Florence. And this was incredibly important for him in making these very realistic uh, chiaroscuro drawings of the moon's surface, which were very important for him in persuading people about the discoveries of the telescope. Um, but I, I was interested then in art and science, and then I had a chance uh, really, uh, when I came back from Stanford to Ireland, to, to really develop my interest in art and science through, first of all, a number of exhibitions, and then through the, uh, you know, I did a project on robotics and art, uh, but then through developing science gallery in Dublin uh, with Trinity College, which was really connecting, you know, at its core for a place for creative collisions between science and art, uh, drawing artists into creative conversations and explorations with scientists, particularly but not exclusively from the university that that we were within. So that really developed a um, as as a, a a space to bring art and science together, um, and uh, I, I suppose there. You know, there are a number of different reasons that uh, it's interesting to bring art and science together. And I, I think sometimes we focus on the less interesting ones. So one thinks that art can be a, an instrument to communicate science, uh, kind of like a, 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 a almost like a, a, 
a propaganda instrument for science. And, and that often doesn't really work as, as a way to bring the two together. Um, uh, there's also the idea that the artist can draw from the new materials and the new tools made available to them by science. Um, but then, then there, there's also um, the idea that artists and scientists together can discover new things. And, and I think that's where it really becomes exciting and, and where you have uh, a, a sense of co-creation, ex a sense of uh, both exploring the unknown uh, and uh, exploring possible futures uh, through the work. And I think that's where it, where, where it really becomes a kind of equal partnership. That's when it gets very exciting. And I think, you know, somebody like Anna is an artist who works in a deeply collaborative way and brings a sensibility uh, in working uh, with scientists, which also draws from craft traditions and, uh, uh, but it's all really uh, uh, based on this very collaborative approach. And, you know, uh, Anna uh, Dimitri, I think is an artist with ears, you know, who, who uh, I mean, I'm not making a comment about your ears, Anna, <laughs> but, but an artist who, who listens to the scientists and is really interested, you know, first to really explore what's going on, what are the questions they're exploring. And I, I think those kinds of collaborations can be really enriching on both sides. Um, you know, people often ask, what's the benefit of bringing the arts and science together? And is, is it just that we'll get publicity in newspapers and so on? Um, but I, I think for the scientists, um, it can all, often be that they, people begin to ask new questions about their work, or they see their work uh, from new perspectives, and they explore its impact on society in new ways. So often it's this sort of deeper and broader uh, uh, impact. Uh, rather than, you know, directly that uh, a, a new piece of research is generated by the collaboration. But uh, uh, but I see now that Maria Elena has joined us, so <laughs> I think maybe you'll be, uh, I should uh, yield uh, my time. I should, so that, I should uh, take over yeah. here, because uh, we will see a few of these things that you just mentioned. So we will have a few examples where these joint discoveries and new perspectives and questions already uh, started to come up in this virtual part of the residency, but I want to welcome Maria Elena. So it, it's great to have you here. And it, it's, um, I want to give the stage now to you just to have a little bit of a background for all our viewers and listeners um, to understand what the IES is and also what motivated you. Uh, we heard a little bit uh, from Michael Sean, but I think you also have your own perspective on that. Yeah, thank you very much, Claudia, and thanks to everybody for joining today. We were joking just before the panel that the internet would go off because of the storm, and there you go, I had that, so I apologize for the delay in getting started to everybody and the audience. And yes, uh, Claudia, so just really very briefly, I mean, Michael John has already said it brilliantly. Um, so the Institute of Epigenetic um, Stem Cells as part of the Helmholtz Center Munich is interested in understanding how cells acquire their identity. and. And uh, that's a little bit some topic that will emerge later, I think, today during the discussion. But I mean, in, in a nutshell, what we're trying to do is understand how, how a cell knows what to do uh, from the very beginning of life and how we can protect our genome, how we can actually understand that identity so that then we can change it so that we can basically sort of generate cells by design that could eventually help us to understand disease eventually, right? But really the, the, the bottom line is to understand how the cells are knowing how to function. And, and then maybe coming back to your question about why I uh, was curious about the about starting a, a, a program of, um, at the IES, is really the curiosity that Michael John just mentioned, is really the, 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 the potential to go a little bit beyond what we do typically and, and share our or on one side our excitement for our research with other people, with an artist like, like Anna, and that has actually been fantastic in spite of uh, Corona, uh, but also do this co-discovery process with, with, you know, with someone who's equally curious about life and understanding and just coming with questions in, in, in a very, very different perspective. And maybe I will uh, stop there and answer more, more questions if you have later. <laughs> Thank you. This is also already a, a really good starting point. And I think I just very briefly want to go to Clara and Stefan for a little comments because you're young researchers uh, and, and uh, you already experienced how also how competitive and, 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 and uh, a deep dive is necessary in the, in the scientific process. So how did you, what did you think when you were confronted with now you have to deal with an artist. 
should I start maybe? Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, from my side, it was, as Maria Elena said, definitely top number one reason was curiosity because, I mean, we as scientists, we are getting very specialized in that sense. We have this training, we go into a PhD, we dive into our projects, we go into on to our postdoc, and we really become more and more specialized. So I think for me, it was a very nice to kind of step a bit um, above this all and kind of also connect with uh, people outside my scientific bubble. And that really was a, a triggering reason for me to say, okay, I want to join this and participate and do something together with Anne. Thank you. And Clara? Hi. Um, so that's all right. Maybe. So from my perspective, I mean, the, the curiosity is obviously coming up as well. Um, and I really didn't know uh, what to expect. I remember the first talk I had with Anna. I went to the not knowing what I was going to have to do and what, what was going to happen. So. Uh, that's, that's a big part of it. And, and especially from my very early career stage perspective. And, uh, and also uh, from the angle of communicating my, my science, which I think is very important and which I thought was a very good opportunity to find a way to manage to communicate what I am driven by with, uh, with Anna, because I think there's, uh, and I realized even in my, in my uh, when I talk with my family and stuff, that it's not easy to communicate my science. So I thought that would be a good exercise to to implement in my um, in the way I see my work. So we already had a lot of expectations, and finally you come to the audience, <laughs> Anna. Um, so we already heard a lot about curiosity and and collaborative practice, especially your collaborative practice, which which is very much uh, listening to to your scientists doing also uh, work hands on. So maybe you want to talk a little bit about your artistic practice so that for those who don't know you yet to, to understand a little bit better where you're coming from. And yeah, then- well, Okay. Um, I can say, so I work specifically embedded in science settings, very closely collaborating with scientists. A lot of my, like my earliest background was kind of working with artificial life and robotics and things but through that and I was kind of around the same time in sort of the early very early 2000s even like the turn of the last century um I I became very interested in microbiology as well and that both of those areas led me on to things like genomics and that led me into synthetic biology and that's why I was interested in this residency with the Institute for Epigenetics and Stem Cells, because there's lots of areas in that that all interconnect um, and that I had, I'd have to say, quite a poor understanding of. So I work very hands on in the lab. I work with scientists all the time and they basically teach me stuff. So I have this quite deep but quite patchy knowledge of science. I think that's a good way of describing it. And and I, I, I wanted to kind of build on this area and learn about all this kind of stuff because actually everything comes down, like everything about life seems to come down to epigenetics and things when you, when you kind of get into it. So it's, it's hugely important in the scheme of things, but very complicated and kind of hard to understand. So I've been on this massive steep learning curve through these kind of virtual chats that I've been having with all the researchers and with Maria Elena um, and, and kind of going deeply, as deeply as I can into it in a virtual context to kind of get all that grounding there. So when I get to the lab, that I know kind of what I want to do and we can actually build on that. So that's the plan as well. <laughs> so um, you already mentioned here a bit about the, the virtual uh, experience and also how important it is to be in the lab for you for your for your collaborative practice but also for your artistic practice and um actually we plan to have this starting uh this residency to start right uh, from the beginning as a as an on-site uh collaboration and uh so after after the first after or in the first lockdown when we selected you um we still hope that we could start last year in in 
uh, yeah, late summer to do the residency or to start the residency on site, but the pandemic did not uh, let us to do, do so. So we decided to start virtually. So maybe you want to go a little bit on uh, about this virtual experience um, because you, yeah, uh, normally the first meeting is, is uh, yeah, on site, but now you have this opportunity to join virtually first. Uh, yeah, just explore a little bit on that, and then we can also um, go to the scientists and see how, how they experience this first phase, this virtual phase. So what we decided to do was, I mean, it, it was, it's a sort of, it was a fairly short residency that we kind of had planned, wasn't it? It was a few like months here, months there kind of thing. Um, but, and, and that was going to be on site and it was going to be all hands on and experiencing it all in the lab. But what we've kind of done now is that the, the actual live part is pushed back to when it's possible. And what we've done is have these regular meetings with lots of different scientists in the lab, quite in depth, like an hour um, or so with each person, sometimes more than one meeting, um, to to learn more about their research area and, and, and have them kind of do that thing where they patiently explain to me how this stuff works and, and things like that. So it's actually kind of a bit like the copy room chat or sometimes when you break into the, like sometimes they, that I've had this before where scientists will, will, will so you don't understand the central dogma of biology, let me explain it to you and draw on this huge blackboard and kind of th those kind of chats we've had virtually. So now I'm just raring to go and um, do things like temperature experiments with a, what's it called? Proximity ligation assay. We'll talk um, about it too because, yes. <laughs> and all sorts of things like that, but I've got like all these hands-on things that we're just dying to kind of get on with now, but also um, managed to start doing a tentative um, piece of it with Clara as well, which which I suppose I shouldn't talk about either, but, but you know, things... We will have questions um, about that, but yes, she's, she's the audience. <laughs> yeah. so, so things are happening. Uh, it's not ideal, obviously. Nobody wanted like this, but I think we're making the best of it, and I think it's a good use of the time. Maybe some of the scientists want to follow up on this, uh, Maria Elena, what, because uh, I know uh, there was uh, this huge expectation that the residency will start immediately on site, but then we had to shift our plans. So how did you experience this first phase and, and yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess in the end, as, as Anna has said, we've taken the most out of it. We have had quite a lot of chats and I, I think, you know, I, I'm sort of uh, sure that whenever she comes, I'm going to feel like I know her for ages because we've been talking and discussing and, and so on. But obviously the human part of being together and having these spontaneous chats in the corridor, I mean, we're not having that. And obviously, I mean, I can feel Anna is just so much eager to go to the bench and start to get things, things working, right? So I, my feeling is that maybe we have taken it a bit slower than what it would have been in, in a normal residency, but that maybe also gives us the opportunity to think about different options and, and look at the, at the different aspects, you know, like in, in, in a bit of a longer perspective. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm super looking forward to Anna for um, visiting us and, and getting wet hands and, and, and so on. And I'm very much looking forward to that. So that, that's, yeah. Thank you. Um, Stefan, did you want to add something here or uh, I just have another question to Michael Shaw? <laughs> no, I, I absolutely okay. agree on my side, yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, before we go into all of the details of what has happened in between, just uh, because we now had, okay, it, it was a virtual phase and, and we start to bring this on site and into the lab soon. Michael Sean, maybe you want to add something about the experiences with artists and what to expect when you finally meet them and finally are able to work with them. I, I think it's also a little bit about this experiential component and, and the uh, importance of aesthetics and artistic experience, which is not only virtual. Um, uh, and also, yeah, maybe also some, some anecdotes you want to talk about that you think is important to be aware of, but which are also valuable. You're muted. So 
yeah, happy to do that. I mean, I, I think um, uh, that uh, it's always a, a kind of a, a slightly nerve wracking and exciting process bringing a, an artist into a scientific environment. And, and of course, there are now residencies that also go in the other direction, which are also quite interesting, where you bring uh, scientists into art spaces. And I, I would also uh, feel that, that there's a lot of potential in the, those, those types of residencies. Um, uh, one, I think uh, I've had both fantastic experiences and also experiences where you know the it didn't work, and I think one can learn also learn a lot from the the situations where it didn't work. Um, I remember very early on when I was beginning science gallery, um, I had the artist Eduardo Katz uh, visit, who was became famous for creating a, um, a transgenic rabbit, or well, whether he actually created it, he. he uh, uh, displayed it, shall we say, as as uh, as, a, as an artwork, uh, and um, I, I brought him in to meet a lot of nanoscientists in Trinity College, and he immediately started telling them that he wanted to create a sculpture inside his individual cells in his body, uh, and uh, they became very nervous about this. This was their first encounter with an artist, and uh, uh, it basically shut down uh, for several months our communications as a result. So that was less less successful. Um, but then, then with other artists, we had uh, artists such as Dimitri Galfand and uh, Evelina Dominic, who came and um, who, who were uh, really fascinated, a little bit like Anna, to sort of dive into what the scientists were doing, what the what the work was that they were creating, and to you know explore. In that case, they were looking at quantum dots as an artistic material. And uh, um, I mean, I think it's when you have artists who are exploring at the fringes of the science, there can be very interesting insights that emerge that, that can also feed in nicely into the science. What you already talked about and the conversations that were already led at the, uh, at the, at the institute or in this virtual setting. So uh, Anna had the chance to not only have individual conversations, but also join the lab meetings and so on. So uh, the mutability of memory and space was also inspired uh, by Anna's um, uh, yeah, um, exploration of, of what the Institute does. So maybe uh, as all three of you, Maria, Elena, Clara and Stefan, you already had conversations with Anna and very different things came out of these conversations. Um, I would like to ask you to talk about the conversations and, and the ideas and the outcomes because with Pokla, there is already an outcome coming up for this first conversation, and then there are other ideas and, and experiments lined up. So, uh, I, I completely free who wants to start. Maria Elena, do you want to start, or Clara, or Stefan? Well, I mean, I, I can be brief. I just will say that people who know me know that I talk non stop pretty much. So I got carried away with Anna for hours already several times. I think we have touched everything from, you know, one embryo, how to generate a new being to heterochromatin to parasites and, and genome elements. And I think I'll stop there because probably Clara would want to uh, add something on that direction. But uh, I mean, it's been, it's been really, really interesting and quite fruitful, I would say. But also very inspirational to Anna, as I understood. Uh, also, already these conversations that that you had that led to some experiments and uh, artistic experiments. Um, yeah, but Clara, maybe you want to go. On. Yeah, then I can uh, I can jump in um, because it was very very interesting the way it happened with Anna. And tell me if I'm if I'm wrong, Anna. But I was just presenting my project and my interest, and I can go through it a little bit now to explain how. Uh, and, and I think Anna really picked up the words I used. And I, I, I chose these words precisely because I think it's the part that's interesting. And she jumped on that and, and took out her idea out of, out of what I was saying. And I was, I was sharing what um, I, I work on. I'm working on DNA sequences that can move from one position to another in the genome that are called transposable elements. And that constitute a huge proportion of the genome. And that have been very long seen as uh, purely parasitic because they can be, they have been sometimes called the ultimate parasite, the one that is able to colonize genomes. And uh, and in the end, so, so that's I think the first word on which um, Anna picked on, the ultimate parasite. And then I was explaining how the vision is starting to change because we 
key that these elements are actually beneficial to you and are um now we call about we talk about co-option as in these elements can play a role in this developmental process Marie Helena was talking about amongst others and and hence we can even beyond talking about co-option or parasitic element talk about some form of symbiosis and I think that's the other word um Anna uh, noticed the fact that it's actually a long-standing relationship between the two parts of that relationship that end up being uh, what we are today. And this is why she added, I think, to her piece that's called Parta Symbiotics, a regulatory element, a small portion of DNA that I gave her on the Watson paper uh, that contains uh, a transfer, like a, a small part of the transfer really very much. And I'm sure you want to say something, and maybe you also want to explain a little bit uh, more about the artwork and how you approach this and, and your thoughts about this. Well, it's, a, it's an ongoing project that I started probably about 2012, I think. I first did a performance um, for the Welcome Trust for their exhibition. I think it was called something like Superhuman. Um, and it was, it was a thing that I came up with with um, John Paul, one of my long-term collaborators, and we were driving actually to um, to Porton Down, which is the highest security lab in the UK, where I actually did handle anthrax, uh, live anthrax in the lab, um, and learn how to do that safely and properly. And um, we were talking about this idea of could bacteria at the time be beneficial were there bacteria that were not just beneficial but could actually improve us so make us make us better and the project kind of evolved from there so it's evolved into lots of different directions and it it evolved into a sculptural kind of apothecary box which was a commission for the science gallery detroit for their exhibition hustle which was about um you know different forms of hustling and we went into the the idea about hustling as as the sort of the medicine shows of the past, how they used to sell drugs and 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 um, different medicines um, before people could afford medicine, and what what it means for now is like when when we can't understand the science behind things, how do we you know approach this stuff or understand this stuff? Because there are things out there like I found on the internet stem cell therapy um, that you could Google, and when you looked, you can find it on on the internet. And when you looked it up, there's actually plant stem cells. I mean, stem cells, but cell, stem, cells from plant stems, would you believe? And that's being sold out there to people who think they're getting a stem cell therapy. So I'm very interested in this thing about what we can, like the ordinary people can understand when the science is so complicated. So the piece kind of goes into all those directions. And um, the... Um, Medical Museion in Copenhagen are curating a, a big show called The World Is In You for um, uh, the Charlottenburg Museum of Art, um, which will take place later this year. And so they've commissioned a big new version, extended version of Hypersymbiotics with a performance as well, um, which I'll be doing live as my kind of beauty therapist from hell with fake tan. I'm actually thinking of getting Botox for it. I don't know yet. Um, it depends whether I spend some of the budget on it, which is made from a bacteria that makes you better. Um, so it's kind of appropriate. And and so I've been putting lots of my new projects, um, an, an element of each, in into the new work. And when Clara said this, symbiotic, jumping genes, transposable elements, I, I was I was transfixed. So we are now presenting in in the apothecary box. Dr. Clara's jumping genes, the ultimate parasite, is the, the tagline. So that'll, that'll be um, available. She's not yet a doctor, because um, she's still doing her PhD, but we figured that doesn't matter to advertising. So it's kind of playing with that as well. So yeah, that, that's, that's that piece. And, and so that's a sort of early outcome on the direction of what we're doing. And so there'll be a little booklet accompanying it that'll have explanations of all the different things in the uh, in the apothecary box and the performance will kind of do it as well I'll, I'll do something with the performance so you're yeah, having you know, a lot of crazy beauty therapist kind of thing a lot of conversations <laughs> with Clara now but we're sure that they will go on when when you finally visit 
Mm. But uh, there is something completely different actually ha happening uh, in your conversations and collaborations with Stefan. So maybe Stefan, you want to talk a little bit about this? Yes, absolutely. I would love to. So um, maybe I also need to explain a bit what we are interested in to kind of introduce uh, it through, through the conversation that I had with Anna. So um, w we are interested in, in our nucleus that Maria Lena already mentioned that this is basically the place in our cell that determines the cellular identity. That's what decides what a cell is. And one thing to note is that in the nucleus, it's a very, very crowded environment. So there are many, many processes, many, many molecular machines that are need to do their job to make our cells viable and continue. So there's, for example, uh, the DNA has to be copied. That's made by a process named DNA replication that basically makes sure that all the two daughter cells become the same amount of DNA. And there's also another process called transcription that is basically reading out our genes. And one thing is particularly interesting to our lab is that these two processes, they are, they coexist in our nucleus somehow. And they have learned how to live together um, in the nucleus and coordinate these uh, two cellular machineries. And one particular question we are interested in is how does the cell kind of, or how does the nucleus coordinate these two processes? And what happens if something goes wrong and you actually suddenly create a place in, in the genome where these two machineries actually collide with each other and creating a conflict within our genome. And that is something we want to address. We want to understand how often this happens, how frequent this occurs, what's the consequence to the cell if it happens. And uh, we think that this can actually definitely influence our cellular identity. And uh, while I was talking and explaining all these things to Anna, so she got really interested and said, oh, that's interesting. So somehow the cells coordinate these two processes. So uh, what if, for example, our cells become fever? Uh, if there's an environmental stimulus that suddenly you raise the temperature, how does this affect actually our nuclear processes within our cells? And um, that also kind of leads the conversation into something where we said, oh, we actually have an assay in the lab where we can actually monitor now what's the level of these conflicts in the cells um, and like what's the overlap of these two machineries and that's something where we came up with actually a real experiment in the in the lab that we want to do while Anna is hopefully coming soon um, and we can try to address what happens when the cells become fever. Anna do you want to add to this or? Yeah, um, well, I can say, so the thing that sort of triggered it was was that I read somewhere that, that the human body temperature is a bit lower than we thought. So it's a bit lower, like they've been doing studies now, but I guess more precise temperature taking or something, but it, it's a little bit lower than 37 degrees. But the common thing is to grow the cells at 37 degrees. So we were wondering, like, what if we grew them a little bit less or unlike the women and men have different body temperatures, different times of life. And then also thinking about climate change. Um, like if the world is heating up, like how much can we cope with that? And how will that cause things to happen in ourselves? Because I was reading yesterday, uh, uh, there was an article or something like the temperature in Pakistan at the moment is higher than the human body can cope with. And, and things like that. So, so it's sort of all those things kind of interthreaded um, those sort of issues was what was kind of behind that experiment. So we're almost thinking about like the temperature of cells, whether whether it should be reduced because of the, the new study um, or whether like the climate change stuff will, will affect how our bodies work. I mean, it, it almost certainly will, but will it affect it on this level? Uh, I think this is a really interesting uh, also approach and, and it shows very much uh, the different perspectives and the way how artists also contextualize and bring together different kind of knowledge. Because um, talking to Stefan, this is not uh, there. There are other experiments where you do for experiments at different temperatures, but not in this uh, in this specific field. So 
um, maybe you want to elaborate also that this is also a new context, a new um, approach that's also interesting for your research. Exactly. So um, it is not, I mean, there are certain studies where you grow your cells at different temperatures and you look at the response, but it hasn't really been studied um, surprisingly in a way, but uh, like how this coordination is actually then now changed when, when we change the temperature of the cells. And so um, talking to Anna, you know, I was not really thinking in this direction, but uh, it's, it started out of the conversation and, and gave it to an idea where we, uh, that, you know, we can actually do this experiment and see what's going to happen. And uh, I think that was really an interesting conversation that was very productive in that sense. And uh, uh, so uh, I'm very curious uh, what's going to happen, actually, as soon as we can do this. So it, it, it's great to see that we have all this variety already in popping up in this virtual conversation uh, where we can see this uh, joint curiosity, new context, new perspectives, uh, but also really, uh, yeah, um, how did you frame it? Um, collaborative uh, discovery. <laughs> uh, I think Michael Tony said this before, where you can have all these different dimensions when you start to work beyond the, the disciplinary borders and you also bring in this uh, not only the contextualization new perspective of art, but also the more aesthetic component, which also deals with all these different sensory uh, inputs, maybe thinking about how do we look at, at things, how do we understand things, but also how do we experience our environment with the, with the different temperatures. But um, yeah, Maria Elena, do you want to add something about your specific conversations with Anna? Because I think something that's already also related to the title um, came up a little bit of, of this uh, panel came up in your uh, conversations with Anna. So maybe you want to add something here. You're muted. Um, yes, thank, thank you, um, Claudia. Yeah, I guess that the, the title came a little bit, I think it was our very first conversation, Anna, where I was trying to get you excited about what we're doing and why is it important to understand how a cell uh, reaches the uh, identity. And then you immediately said, ah, yeah, it's like memories, right? And how will the cells lose or, or gain a memory? And, and so we got a bit, I, mean, I got a bit carried away because this is exactly what we studied. This is the process of reprogramming. And, and I think, you know, fundamentally, this can generate quite a lot of curiosity also in different, in different lines. And I, I, when, when Anna and Clara told me about these parasites coming up into the parasite, well, actually, these parasites are also doing that, that memory um, erasure in, in certain cases. Uh, so I guess that, you know, in, in a sense, that brings me to the fundamentals of what has been driving my research for the last 15, 20 years. It's obviously in, in, in a very different manner, um, where I can start to think about a lot of different things, right? So again, this, this creating together with, with, with Anna in that regard, at least, at least here in my mind, has, has been really very, very um, inspiring, especially in, in the time when we have been under lockdown and you know, we can't go to the meeting, we can't uh, talk to our scientific colleagues at meetings. So yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess that this, this uh, memory uh, mutability that obviously Anna put in, in much nicer and brighter terms than I did, it is really the fundamentals that we've been, we've been studying. Uh, and just very briefly to add, uh, to Claudia, what you were just discussing now about the environment, this is precisely what Helmholtz and Community is about, right? What, how is the environment affecting all these different processes. In our case, it's really how the cells can be reprogrammed and eventually we want to help people with that, right? Um, but, but that's exactly it. So that, that's, that's a very interesting sort of standpoint to say, you know, actually what I'm doing is so fascinating that, that there's so many other things that can come, come across. Now I feel that, you know, we have so many projects that we can probably have one artist per project and, and populate the whole institute with, uh, I don't know how many people, but um, anyhow, yeah. So, 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 so these this fundamentals of, of the concepts of our research have been quite nice to discuss with Anna. Uh, this, is, this is a really, and I'm aware a little bit of the time, although we started late, um, we have to uh, remind that there is a, a, a championship match that a few people want to attend. <laughs> happening soon. So uh, I, 
I think this was a really, uh, and I also really think that this was a very nice uh, final uh, statement from, from your side, Maria Elena, but I want to direct one more question to Michael John and then uh, a final question to all of you. So uh, we had already all these different aspects uh, that came up in this uh, virtual part of the residency before Anna is really starting to, to be on site. But uh, as far as I know, Michael John, maybe you want to give us a little bit of a sneak peek because you want to also do some more uh, on-site things with artists in your own space. So maybe you want to give us some insight on that before we have a final question. Sure. Yeah. And, and, but, but before that, I, I, I do think that this theme of the mutability of memories and faiths is a really fantastic theme. And, and I'm really excited to see what emerges from the, the residency. And I, I love the kind of the plasticity of the past and the, also the idea of the, you know, uh, this counter to this idea of genetic de determinism that is still so prevalent. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, and you know, I, I think that the role of artists can often be to kind of help us navigate the future, uh, and to to uh, uh, and and uh, so I love this discussion about um, you know temperature effects on cells and so on. I think that's precisely the conversations that we need to be having, and that uh, can be provoked by this kind of context. So I'm excited to see, uh, as well as Clara's jumping genes, what what emerges from the residency. And I'm also very interested in that because, uh, as you mentioned, Claudia, in Biotopia, the new museum that we're building in Munich. Um, you know, this is a museum of life sciences and environment, and uh, it will um, really draw people into conversations about life and, and creative uh, exploration of life, uh, kind of like a counterpoint to the Deutsches Museum, which is, you know, this world famous museum about, it's really a kind of a cathedral to the machine and the machine age and technic, you know, and uh, uh, we, we're, we're exploring life and, and living systems. And we will have opportunities for artist residencies. We will have uh, apartments in the building. We will have a series of labs, including a bio art and design studio where artists will get to work with, um, and designers with biological materials. Uh, we will have a small uh, S2 lab, like a biosafety level two lab within the within the, the lab space, particularly for the residencies. Uh, so this is very much uh, part of our thinking for Biotopia. Uh, we believe that artists can open up different questions and, and open up these topics around life and living systems from different angles and uh, really help to provoke those conversations between science and society in in a, in a important direction. So we're 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 also um, excited at the chances that might emerge to to also collaborate with what's going on in Helmholtz Center in Munich in, in this regard because uh, uh, it's um, it's great that you can be our guinea pigs uh, for for artist residencies, so to speak, and. Uh, uh, that we can uh, learn from you uh, as we develop Biotopia. Uh, thank you for, for, this, for this, this transition to say, uh, guinea pigs, learn from this. What are expectations? So I, I really uh, would like to ask everybody now, um, what are your hopes, expectations, uh, learnings that you already, that you either expect to make or that you already made and that were unexpected in this process. So just the final statement from everyone. Uh, Claudia Elena. Okay, thank you. Uh, actually, I already done, so I'll read it. Don't worry, it's just very short, but I thought I should grab that. So I, I have five altogether. Uh, the first one is really to create with a process, to rediscover um, in the process, to rediscover our own research is the second one. But I also want to change views, both of our scientists, our younger generation and our older generation. So to change views, to motivate people both to do research and to embark into artistic um, uh, collaborations and to promote that we think a little bit out of the box as we tend to uh, do too much of research on very old sets. So that, that's some of my expectations. My list is a little bit longer, but I think I stopped it. <laughs> That's already a great list. Um, yeah, for me, it's um, you. When when do you get a chance to talk to an artist as as a scientist? So so to me, it's also a, a unique opportunity to um, it, discuss and communicate my science, um, um, and also 
being forced to explain it in a way that everybody can understand it. And I think that is a, a really important skill that we need to also train, particularly as scientists. And I think uh, it's not easy because, as I said, you get very specialized in that sense. Um, and on the other hand, I'm just really curious about the results of this experiment and see what's happening to ourselves. So this is just a general curiosity. I think that we have both in common as a scientist and an artist. And I think this is, will be a very fascinating, interesting synergy. And I can't wait to, to see what's happening. Me neither. <laughs> Clara, <laughs> what about you? I think I'm going to go very much along the lines of what Stefan has said, because, and, and this word I think came up almost throughout this session, the curiosity, and I can't really tell what, I, what I'm expecting exactly because I don't know. I'm just curious to see how it's gonna, what it's going to give. And I think we don't only share as scientists with artists the curiosity, but also the, the creativity, which is necessary. And I, I'm, I'm just curious how like the combined creativity is going to give. And I think providing that just one single discussion gave um, ideas to Anna, I'm, I'm, I'm confident that having her in the lab around coffee breaks and stuff, she's going to create a lot of creative initi initiatives. Thank you. Now, Anna, I'm sure you want to add something to this. Um, I mean, I, I like the boring bits in the lab as well. I always talk about um, the bits where the machine's doing something, you have to wait like five minutes whilst the PCR machine's doing it, you're just twiddling your thumb. And that's when I think the really interesting conversations happen, when they're totally, like, you're just trying to fill the air times. You're, so, what do you think of this? Or what about this? And you can ask really weird questions. Um, so, so I think the the hope is that, the hope for me is that I will manage to really learn and understand the whole kind of uh, sufficiently understand epigenetics and stem cell research to the level where I can make some good art that everyone will like <laughs> appreciate hopefully um that, that kind of takes people out of themselves and takes it to another kind of transformative way and makes people think so it's something that can um that can have all the detail of the research in it but also be quite a, a simple idea it's a sort of starting point so sort of draw you in to the story of it i mean one thing we were talking about that i should mention we haven't talked about is is like the epigenetic effects of the covid pandemic and the fact that we've all been kind of talking like this and um you know in our own homes for a certain period and how this will change us epigenetically and how babies that are born from the pandemic might have epigenetic changes that come on in future generations. So, I mean, all this stuff needs to be kind of incorporated in this story that we're telling. We can't take ourselves out of this time. We need to kind of talk about this time as well. So something, something, I just, I just want to make art <laughs> and I want to make art that, um, that encapsulates everything that we're talking about, basically, which is probably a big challenge, but. But it, it, it's a really important point. So you want to make art, the scientists want to make science, but there is this shared process, the creative process, and the shared uh, curiosity and, and, and bring together interesting discussions. Uh, so maybe, Michael Sean, you want to add another last? Well, there, there's not much to add to that, but, but I think, um, you know, we, we have been living in this very uh, strange time when, when we've been... Uh, uh, deprived of uh, human contact and also this uh, material play that is so important for to the work of people like Anna, you know, getting your hands wet, we talked about getting your hands dirty and uh, exploring the material together. Uh, and uh, I, I think that that uh, it's it's really going to be interesting to to have that opportunity really to dive in. I think we all have a thirst, a craving for embodied experiences now for, for uh, uh, for, for, and, and I, th I think the type of spontaneous interactions that happen when one is physically in the lab are completely different from the kinds of things that one can have uh, over go to meeting or whatever uh, tool one is using. Uh, so, so I think that um, uh, this this type of uh, work really depends on that material interaction. Also, depends on the interaction with the public, uh, the physical interaction with the public, which is also. Uh, something that we all have been deprived of uh, for such a long time, especially in the museum and gallery world. 
so I, I do hope that uh, that it is now possible to to for Anna to come to Munich. That's my big hope. <laughs> That's I think the number one on the list. <laughs> Uh, and I hope that we can, uh, yeah, that we can all meet in Munich soon. So uh, there are plans. So I'm aware that we are already in, way into the starting of the of the of the mm. championship match. So uh, we have to close now. But um, yeah, so Anna will come to the lab. So everybody watching, stay tuned and uh, watch social media and and what's happening with RTIS because. There will be a lot happening as soon as uh, Anna will be able to come to Munich and as soon we will uh, share the process and more about the process and also the outcomes. So thank you. And thank you to all the panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Claudia. And thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone.